It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question to the uh, Premier about the ongoing uh, job losses uh, in the province of Ontario. I think, Premier, you'd agree with me that Ontario is at a crucial inflection point. We can continue down the same path we're on of job losses, high youth unemployment, a province where a million men and women woke up this morning who want to work who have no job to go to. Or we can choose a, a new path for a better Ontario. We've laid out our plan to do exactly that. We woke up this morning to another series of job losses. Here's Canada, almost 800 jobs, the large majority here in the province of Ontario. They'll be closing down their parts processing plant in Belleville, by way of example. Um, you know, Premier, I agreed to, to clear the decks to see your jobs plan. It seems like every day, every week, more and more job losses. Question. Manufacturing. Will we actually see a plan before Christmas, or is this the best you can do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know that the uh, leader of the opposition will want to uh, hear some more of the names of companies that are coming to Ontario who are creating jobs and expanding. And I will uh, I will speak to those in the supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, we actually have a plan, and I have spoken about this plan many times, as has my team. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that investments in people, making sure that people have the right skills, making sure that they have the right training opportunities, investments in infrastructure that will allow communities to draw business to their communities make sure that goods can move around the uh, this re the GTHA region and beyond mr. speaker and investment in a business climate mr. speaker that is competitive that is innovative and dynamic that allows businesses to thrive those are the investments and that's the framework within which our uh, our plan is functioning, mr. speaker businesses are coming to Ontario I understand that the manufacturing sector Order. is going through a transition mr. speaker and we are very Thank aware you. of that all the more important that we create that Thank environment you. for business Mr. Supplementary. Hold, hold on a second here. The Premier calls 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost a transition. She calls the loss of almost 40,000 manufacturing jobs under her leadership alone a transition. I call it a hollowing out. I call it a decline in the province of Ontario. I call it an economic disaster. And for you to stand here and say, oh, it's just a transition. Oh, it's just the forces of globalization. The problem is, Premier, these plants are leaving your province of Ontario and setting up shop in the States, in Quebec. John Deere, which had built farm equipment in the Niagara Peninsula for decades, picked up stock. That is still being built, but it's in the state of Wisconsin. Heinz had made ketchup for a hundred years in Leamington, in the province of Ontario. We'll still live by Heinz ketchup. It's going to be made Question. in the state of Ohio. Don't give me this garbage about a transition. This is a serious issue. It needs a serious plan. If you don't have one, step Thank aside. You. We've got a plan. Don't take it. You see this, please? You see this, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That'll do. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And what the Leader of the Opposition needs to also acknowledge is that there are 460,900 net new jobs in Ontario. Yeah. from Leeds Grenville will come to order. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. The member from Lambton Kent Middlesex will come to order. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I understand that there is a change in our economy, but that change is bringing business and bringing companies to Ontario, and there are changes happening in terms of, uh, of, of companies leaving. But there is an exchange, Mr. Speaker. Green Arc Tire Manufacturing, St. Mary's, Ontario, Auto Supplies Manufacturer, opening North America's largest tire remanufacturing plant, 340 jobs. Answer. He's a uh, Verpacking and Bradford, Mr. Speaker, plastics manufacturer, 50 to 70 new positions. There are jobs coming, Mr. Speaker, and we have to create that environment so that that will continue. Supplementary. We've lost, we, we've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. That's a, that's a net loss. That is a hollowing out 
of our manufacturing sector. That's a weakening of the middle class of Ontario. And, and I can't understand, I cannot fathom this Pollyanna attitude that you have. Mr. Mr. Trading Mr. College and Universities come to order. Job losses were a myth. Now she shrugs off and says, well, Speaker, it's just a transition. You tell that to the families in Leamington, Ontario, who've got no job to go to come next year. You tell the folks at John Deere. It's a sad state of affairs, Premier, when Ontario's leading export today is manufacturing jobs going across the border to the U.S. Exactly. We cleared the path. We said, put your plan on the table. You've got no plan. You're driving up hydro rates. You're putting in new red tape every day. You're increasing taxes. Your plan is not working. It's time to actually clear the decks of this government and bring in a new plan to restore hope, to restore optimism, Thank you. restore our middle class. You got no plan here, I am. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. I think if the Leader of the Opposition spoke to the Ford employees in Oakville, where we've invested $70 million, Mr. Speaker, to allow those 2,800 jobs to be preserved, Mr. Speaker, and to allow Ford to compete globally, uh, I think that the, uh, that the families in, in Oakville, Mr. Speaker, would be very, very positive about our plan. I know that the Leader of the Opposition is having a town hall in Leamington, I think, in the area in the next couple of days. I know that he's going to try to claim that there is only doom and gloom, that there is no opportunity for for, uh, for the possibility of success in going forward. I know that his member who was at the meeting last Friday has since said that that meeting was not worthwhile. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, we have been on the ground in Leamington. We understand that families are suffering. We are working with the community. There are possibilities there, Mr. Speaker, and it would be a very good idea Answer. for the Leader of the Opposition and his members to work with the community rather than stirring up negativity. That's not the way to make success, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? You see it? The uh, Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. The Minister of the Environment will come to order. And the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. New question. Back to the, uh, the Premier and her lack of a plan for jobs. You know, there was a story about uh, President Truman where they told Truman to go and give Congress help. And Truman said, all I have to do is tell them the facts and they'll think it's help. Premier, 300,000 fewer manufacturing jobs in our province. You're hollowing out the middle class. Ontario is last in growth in all of Canada when it comes to income. My Ontario will always lead Canada. My Ontario is one of hope, it's of opportunity. It's where we're bringing good jobs to the province, not sending them across the border. The Ontario we've always known was the leader, the best place for work. Now we're at the back of the pack. You call that a myth? You call that a mere transition? Do your ideological blinders yes. prohibit you from understanding the challenges that we're facing in the province of Ontario? So is it simply globalization, or can you tell me why, Premier, that Ontario under the Liberals is last in growth of income of all ten provinces? How do we go from first to the back of the pack? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition would like to, in his argument, explain how we've achieved 460,000-plus net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, since 2009. We've done that. by creating a competitive environment, Mr. Speaker, so that business come to the province. I That'll do. I did not get quiet, so any member can continue the dialogue, including the Minister of Finance and the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. And if I hope you've noticed that I'm mentioning your writings, which means if you use up your time, you're gone. Much, Mr. Speaker. I'm not suggesting that our work is done. Obviously, there is more to be done, and the recovery has not been in this jurisdiction or other jurisdictions as quick as as fast as we would have liked it to be, Mr. Speaker. But the people at Ericsson Canada, Toyota, Ford, GM, Green Tire Manufacturing, Gizeh, Nutera, Pillar 5, Lambton yeah. Conveyor, 
Pabico Plastics, NSG Canada, all of those companies, Mr. Speaker, have benefited from investments and support from this government. We are working with those companies, Mr. Speaker. Jobs are being created. That is that is Thank our you. plan, and it is working, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I, I quoted Harry Truman, and she quotes Bobby McFerrin. She says, "Don't worry, be happy. Things are just <laughs> doing great across the province of Ontario." The problem is, Premier, that's, that's simply not the reality. We're down 300,000 manufacturing jobs. We actually have the lowest wage growth of any province uh, in Canada. Uh, facts are, are stubborn things, Premier, but these are the facts that families are facing each and every day. I'll give you two more examples. You referenced GM. GM had made the Camaro in Oshawa. Now the Camaro is going to be made in the state of Michigan. Caterpillar had made their equipment in London, Ontario. That equipment now made in Indiana. The point I'm making, Premier, that the Liberal benches don't seem to grasp, these products are still being made. They're still being sold. They're still being bought. Question. They're no longer being made in the great province of Ontario. Why does that keep happening over and over and over again? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And why has the opposition party not supported our efforts the member to support from Cambridge the will come to order. Speaker? Why has the opposition party not supported our regional uh, economic development plans, Mr. Speaker? Why is the opposition not supporting and working with us to get the supporting small uh, businesses Prince act passed, the infrastructure for jobs and prosperity act, the uh, local food act? That happened. We got that passed, Mr. And Speaker. The member from and the, the waste Carlton. Act. Why is the opposition not working with us to get those pieces of legislation passed that will create jobs? I understand that it is the job of the opposition to challenge us. I understand that, Mr. Speaker. But it is also the job of the opposition to be consistent. And if they are interested in job creation, they should support us on those pieces of legislation that are going to create jobs in the province. I look for that support, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. But the problem, Premier, is you're creating jobs in Michigan. Yes. <laughs> you, you know what? Yeah, I think you missed this point. Michigan has now passed the province of Ontario in auto production. We had been the leaders, the chief jurisdiction, top of the pile when it comes to auto production in North America. Michigan blew by us. And why did that happen? Because you've Minister doubled energy rates in the province of Ontario. You've increased taxes. You've yes. hollowed our middle class. You pile on more and more and more red tape. And you're more interested in kissing the ring of Al Gore, whose policies have driven our hydro rates through the roof. Who do I put on top? Ontario workers, families who need jobs. You can appease Al Gore all you want to. I'm going to stand with working families in our province who want good jobs and want a strong manufacturing house. That's where we stand. Why don't we? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. The, uh, as I remind members on an ongoing basis, when I ask for quiet and it does get quiet, it's not the moment for you to inject. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what we know about the plan of the uh, Leader of the Opposition is that we would lose 10,000 education workers in this province, Mr. Speaker. We would fire 2,000 health care workers. There would be a cut and slash regime in this province, much, much the way we had a cut and slash regime when he was in Cabinet previously, Mr. Speaker. I do not believe that in order to have a strong and aspirational Ontario that we have to sacrifice our environmental protections. I do not believe that having a strong and aspirational Ontario means that we have to undermine the relationship between organized labor and government and declare war on the people who have made sure that our workplaces have been safe and have developed those protections over years. That is what the opposition would do, Mr. Speaker. They would gut the unionized labor, they would fire people out of the public service, and they, Mr. Speaker, would cut and slash. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from the Minister of Community and Social Services will come to order, and the member from the P and Carleton will come to order. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Next week, the government will announce another long-term energy plan. 
Since the last plan was introduced, the public has seen their electricity bills surge with private power contracts cancelled and otherwise. Why should they believe that this plan will be any different? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to uh, speak to this in the supplementary. But what I would say to the uh, uh, member for Toronto Danforth, because I know in his uh, in his career he has been very, very supportive of clean energy. He's been supportive of conservation, and I hope that when the long-term energy plan comes out next week and he sees the focus on conservation that uh, that we uh, that we are going to entrench in that plan, Mr. Speaker, that he will be supportive because I think it's. Speaks to many of the core values that he has held in the past, and Mr. Speaker, core values that I think have uh, been held by the NDP in the past. So I, I hope that he will see that and he will be able to support. Uh, he will be able to support our long-term energy plan. Supplementary. Boy, if you'd listened to us earlier, we'd have much lower electricity bills. <laughs> The government, the government has claimed multiple times to have a long-term plan for electricity, but the plans always seem to change, and Ontarians have the bills to prove it. A billion dollars for cancelled private power deals in Oakville and Thunder Mississauga, Day, $180 million dollars for unneeded new nuclear reactors, $900 million dollars worth of contracts signed for nuclear refurbishment for a contract that doesn't even have a business case presented. Why should people believe that this government will have a plan that will work for Ontarians when, frankly, your plans haven't worked for a decade? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm, I fear that if we listened to them, we would have had no rebuilt transmission, Mr. Speaker. There would have been no investments into the system. And, Mr. Speaker, there actually wouldn't have been a plan. So we do have a plan. We, uh, what we know is that the uh, NDP, this version of the NDP, has opposed nuclear. They've opposed wind and solar. They've opposed gas, Mr. Speaker. They've opposed pretty much everything that we've put forward, which is why I said maybe when we bring forward the long-term energy plan with conservation as a, as a lead element that they might support that. But there has been no plan, surprisingly, coming from those quarters, Mr. Speaker. We've had the plan, we've made the investments, and that will be reflected in our long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. I wouldn't exactly call that an answer. <laughs> Families and businesses in Ontario are paying the highest electricity rates in Canada, nearly twice as high as their neighbours in Manitoba. The fact is the government's electricity plans have helped private power companies getting paid for cancelled contracts, but they left Ontarians with massive bills. What assurances can the Premier offer to people that the new plan is not just another public relations exercise from a government that's left the public carrying the bills for 10 years of misadventure? Mr. Speaker, uh, the member will be able to see the long-term energy plan uh, this coming Monday. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's forward-looking. Uh, it is very sensitive to the ratepayer, Mr. Speaker. But with respect to private developers, Mr. Speaker, the member from Toronto Danforth has made it quite clear that he condemns private investment in power generation in Ontario. But when the NDP party last formed government, they signed nine private power generating contracts for natural gas plants in a five-year span, totaling over 400 megawatts of generation. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that Ontario has a hybrid system, that cat's out of the a healthy bag. mix of publicly owned generation and private investments that help drive our economy and create tens of thousands of jobs in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the NDP plan to eliminate private investment in Ontario's Answer. energy sector would not only cause thousands of job losses, but Mr. Speaker, would also result in higher hydro rates for Ontario's Thank families you. and businesses. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. he's an ideologue and he doesn't know how to. New question. The member from Beaches East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, families are feeling squeezed. Uh, by tough times, and they're worried about the future. But at the same time as families keep getting asked to tighten their belts, public sector CEO pay keeps going up. Since 2010, the New Democrats have been saying it's time to put a hard cap on public sector CEO salary. In September 2012, the Minister of Finance said the government would move forward with a cap. He said, and I quote him, 
It will work to bring some of the overly generous compensation packages back to reality. End of quote. Does the Premier agree it's time to put a hard cap on public sector CEO pay? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the member uh, knows, the NDP uh, supported the budget in which we committed to examining uh, some measures to uh, manage compensation costs, including considering hard caps. That work is uh, is happening right now, Mr. Speaker, and we'll be implementing uh, new measures. We'll be bringing those uh, forth in the in the next few months, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, member of the third party understands that that was part of what we agreed to in the uh, in the 2013 budget. Thank you. Supplementary. It may have been part of the deal, but we keep waiting and waiting. It would take the average Canadian nine years to earn $418,000, which is twice the Premier's pay. It, it's pretty generous as an annual paycheck. In 2012, the Liberal government finally agreed it was time to cap public sector CEO salaries at a level two times higher than the Premier. The Premier has no problem telling hardworking families they'll have to get by with less. Will she agree to follow through on the commitment the government made and do it now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I've already said that we uh, we are working on this. That the the uh, measures will come forward in the next few months. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to just be clear that we have to have uh, we have to have more than a blunt instrument as we deal with this issue because there are there are sectors where there's uh, where there's there's expertise that's needed. So whether we're talking about medical professionals or nuclear technicians who are vital to running the services that uh, that are needed in the province and that the system relies. On, Mr. Speaker, we have an obligation to make sure that those systems are run well. So we are doing the work as we committed to do in the 2013 budget, Mr. Speaker. Those initiatives will come forward in the next few months, and I hope that uh, I hope that the uh, member from the uh, the third party understands that it's going to be very important that we do this in a in a sophisticated way, so that we have that's the right. expertise that's needed in every sector across the province. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Most Ontario families haven't seen a raise. In in years, and every time they open the newspaper, they see billions wasted on gas plants, e-health, and orange. Will the Premier take a small step tomorrow to show some respect for their money and for the plight many of them find themselves in and support the bill to cap public sector CEO pay? Well, Mr. Speaker, we've already said that we are working on a plan and some initiatives that we're going to bring forward. That's what we said we were going to do in the 2013 budget, and that is what we were doing. And as I have said, we need to make sure that whatever we bring forward is not a blunt instrument that doesn't recognize that there are needs in different sectors. So we need to look at how this can work so that we get the expertise that we need, whether it's, as I say, nuclear technicians or within the, the medical field. And I agree, Mr. Speaker, that we need to put in place some controls on executive compensation. That absolutely needs to happen. That's why it was in the 2013 budget. We'll bring those initiatives forward. Order. And my hope is, Mr. Speaker, that the uh, member from the third party will be able to work with us as we uh, introduce those initiatives. Thank you. New question. Member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Health admitted that she was surprised that Chris Mazza was back on her payroll. Not long ago, the Minister called Chris Mazza a liar. She fired him from his job as CEO of Orange. She called in the OPP to investigate him. She knows that he's under investigation by the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and she knows that he put frontline armed staff and patients at risk. And now he's working in the emergency ward at the Thunder Bay Hospital. When asked yesterday how she would feel if he was working on her in that emergency ward, she refused to answer. And yet this minister claims she has no authority to keep Question. this man off the public payroll and away from patients. I ask this to the Premier. If the Minister of Health has no authority to ensure this Thank man you. doesn't get anywhere near the public payroll, who does? Thank you. Thank you. Premier. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think that this question was answered uh, very well yesterday by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And I will, and I will. Uh, I know she may want to comment in the supplementary, but I just, I just want to say that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care made it very clear yesterday how these hiring processes are done, Mr. Speaker. The comment that I want to add is that I know that the uh, member opposite is not suggesting that we somehow find a way to go around due process, Mr. Exactly. Speaker. That there there is due process, and there have obviously been processes that have been begun because of, uh, of this person's previous activities. But I'm, I'm sure that the member opposite is not suggesting that we would somehow contravene that due process that is there for the protection of every citizen in this province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Actually, Speaker, I am suggesting precisely that. If the Chief of Staff at the Thunder Bay Hospital doesn't know enough not to put this man on the payroll, then the Premier should overrule that decision. That's what I'm saying. This is a man who a senior Orange executive revealed that while under the employ of Chris Mazza, he became addicted to Percocet, and it was Chris Mazza, as the CEO of Orange, who prescribed his addiction by prescribing those drugs. That's Chris Mazza. That's the kind of reputation he has, putting frontline orange staff at risk, mismanaging millions of dollars, putting the Ontario taxpayers into debt to the tune of multi-millions. I say to the Premier again, this man has no place on the payroll of the province of Ontario, let alone in the emergency ward of one of our hospitals. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I, I watched the, uh, the party opposite stand up and cheer uh, a, a sort of line of argument that would lead to a very, very dangerous set of precedents, I believe, Mr. Speaker. And so I don't know whether we're getting insight into the kind of society that the, uh, the Conservative Party, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario would have in place a society where individuals... The uh, member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke... The member from Renfrew, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The Minister of Energy, the Minister of Rural Affairs and the Attorney General will come to order. The member from Nipi and Carleton will come to order. I remembered them all, and I've told a few of you more than once. My next time is a warning. Speaker, so that would be a society where the College of Physicians and Surgeons would no longer have the authority that they have now. It would be a society where due process would be thrown aside and an individual the politician would make a decision about another individual without the benefit of due process. I don't believe that's the society that we've built over the last 150 years, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and I don't think it's a society that would protect the interests of the population of Ontario. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question? The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For the last year, the government has been suggesting that a deal with Cliffs was a done deal. But a year ago, a VP at Cliffs, Bill Bohr, told the Sudbury Chamber of Commerce that they were concerned about progress the Liberal government was making on the Ring of Fire. In March of 2012, Bloor said Cliffs needed to sign a definitive document before it could develop the Black Thor in the Ring of Fire. Did the government sign a definitive document with Cliffs, and what commitments were in that definitive document? Premier. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister of Northern Development Thank you very and Mines. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, certainly, as the member knows and people remember, though, the uh, Ring of Fire continues to be a project that we're working very, very um, diligently on. And in fact, of course, have uh, set up a development corporation in which we're trying to engage uh, both industry, protecting First Nations, and the federal government. In terms of your specific question, though, I mean, let's be clear. I mean, indeed, we have had very significant conversations with a number of companies, and that does include 
absolute glimpse. In terms of the details of uh, those discussions, they are, um, uh, for commercial reasons, very confidential. And I think that is important. It remains the case, particularly as, particularly as indeed, uh, the company itself has announced a suspension, a delay, rather than uh, stopping their seizing their interest in the project. So, may I say, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we want to continue to focus on moving forward. We want to continue to focus on developing the Ring of Fire and doing all the. Thank you. Uh, I stand you sit. Member, supple. All right, Mr. Speaker, let's try this again. So the Liberal government pushed Cliffs away from Ontario. Cliff was raising concerns over a year ago, and we don't know what commitments were made to Cliffs. And we don't know whether the Liberal government lived up to its end of the bargain. In March of 2013, Cliff was still pursuing a definitive document. Did the government sign a definitive document with Cliffs? And if not, why not? Good. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what we, uh, we all do know indeed is that indeed we've, we've been engaged in very significant conversations with a number of companies, and that certainly very much includes Cliffs. And we're going to continue to carry on those discussions. And what we also know, Mr. Speaker, is that we are committed to moving forward with making decisions related to some of the key aspects of the Ring of Fire, and that certainly very much includes infrastructure. And, and that's why we have formed the Development Corporation and are bringing so many uh, different organizations and partners to the table. And obviously we hope that includes First Nations, the federal government, and industry. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, certainly it would not be um, in any way appropriate or fair to anybody, and I think the member knows that, to be talking in terms of the details that the member th seems Answer. to think is so crucial. What's crucial is moving forward with the Ring of Fire development on the First Nations consultations, which are so vital, and may I say, on forming Thank the you. development corporation, which will be, will be the key. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I will remind the minister when I stand, you sit. Did you forget? You forgot. No question, the member from Vaughan. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, I'm sure many members in this House will agree that one of the most common questions that we receive from our constituents is regarding their hydro bills. It certainly is one of the most frequent calls that I receive in my constituency office in Vaughan. As we know, hydro bills have many different components, and it can be difficult for folks in our communities to understand what each part represents. I also hear from constituents wondering how they can better manage their energy consumption to reduce their bills and to reduce the impact of their energy usage on the environment. As this is something that we all hear regularly from our constituents, I feel it's important for Ontarians to have a better understanding of the province's electricity system. Speaker, I'm wondering if the minister could please provide the House with an update regarding any initiatives being undertaken to increase Question. energy literacy. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for his timely question. Uh, the need to promote energy literacy is something that we heard from Ontarians from across the province during consultations for the long-term energy plan. And it is an important priority for the Minister of Energy. In fact, just yesterday morning, I was at the launch the Hydro One Electricity Discovery Centre at the University of Toronto. Members may remember seeing the Discovery Centre at the International Ploughing Match and the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Yes, I did. The Discovery Centre is a fully mobile customer education tool designed to engage and educate consumers. And, Mr. Speaker, it's one of the several initiatives we are introducing as part of our commitment to keeping Ontarians informed about the electricity system. Two supplementary. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for both his response and for the outstanding job he's doing on behalf of the people of Ontario. This definitely does sound like a, an extremely worthwhile initiative. Promoting energy literacy will help Ontarians improve their understanding of how our system works. It'll help them understand how their energy choices affect their bills and our environment, and it will also help them better manage their own energy consumption. I understand the need to promote energy literacy among Ontarians is also a message that we've all heard from the Environmental Commissioner Gord Miller. Given the complexity of the modern system and the amount of correspondence that I and many others receive from constituents who are confused about their bills, helping the public better understand Ontario's electri electricity system has never been more important. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House regarding what kind of information the Discovery Centre will provide and how I can Question. make that information available to the constituents in my community? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. 
The Discovery Centre provides the opportunity for visitors to learn about Hydro One and Ontario's electricity system in an engaging and interactive way, Mr. Speaker. Specifically, visitors can learn about electrical safety, important tips on managing electricity use and costs, how the Remember electricity from Bruce system Gray is and the we'll benefits to of investing to keep it up to date for future generations of consumers. Mr. Speaker, the mobile format of the Discovery Centre brings interactive and engaging exhibits to consumers' fingertips. To ensure this information is available to all Ontarians, Hydro One will work with any MPP to bring the Discovery Centre to their own riding. Rob Billigan wants it. I invite all members to take advantage Over. of this excellent resource. Thank you. New question, the member from the PN Carlton. Thanks so very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is as well to the Minister of Energy. Good morning, Minister. Earlier today, you confirmed, I think, what is the worst kept secret in Ontario <laughs> right now, and that is you are going to announce the long-term energy plan the day before uh, the Premier is set to appear again before the Justice Committee probing the gas plant. So it's an obvious distraction. I note also that last week, calm down. I note also that last week, in speaking to the press, the minister suggested his long-term plan would be quote short-term in nature. So with that contradiction alone, it is very hard to take this minister's long-term long energy plan seriously. So let's consider what the last LTEP had in it. It's, it had a rigid adherence to uh, wind energy that has cost this province dearly, particularly the ratepayer. Then it planned for two gas plants, which they later cancelled for political decisions. Question. Now we have OPM asking for another 30 per cent rate increase. Speaker, I asked the minister a very serious question. Is Thank there you. any reason that Heinz and others Thank are you. leaving this province? Thank you. Mr. Uh, speaker, uh, sometimes questions come from the opposition that are uh, quite uninformed, and I'm pleased that the uh, critic chose to use the Heinz example. Because, Mr. Speaker, the Heinz facility in Leamington, Ontario, has a seven megawatt cogeneration plant oh, she located didn't even know on that. site. Oh, Mr. Speaker, didn't even know that. It's generating its dirty. own electricity under our system at very, very cheap prices, Mr. Speaker. Exactly. They're not on the grid. Mr. Speaker, it's uninformed, as all of her wow. uh, comments and her question are uninformed. Mr. Speaker, we've come from a deficit that they've created to a surplus. We've come from dirty generation to clean generation. Mr. Mr. Speaker, their record is a disgrace. Our record is laudable, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Oh. Supplementary. Speaker, the truth hurts, the facts hurt deeper. Stop the clock. Order. I, I can't hear when you heckled either. Well, no, that's my job. You're not getting the last word either. No, you're not. If you say it again, I will warn you. I don't need challenges here. Supplementary, please. He bungles and he blusters this entire energy file, but if he won't take my word for it, why don't we talk about the report released yesterday from the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturer? from Sudbury, come to order. I'm just going to let their quotes speak for themselves, Speaker. More recently, a combination of factors, not of which is the least of the revised policy goals that converge to make Ontario rates higher than competing jurisdictions. For example, electricity costs for a typical large-scale assembly operation in the United States South or Midwest are estimated to be as much as a five million dollar bill lower than those in Ontario. A penalty speaker that they say is now well known to decision makers. Further, they say, for example, Toronto large power users pay 123 per cent more than Chicago Question. consumers, 50 per cent more than Nashville, and 37 per cent more than Detroit. Why are they running businesses out of this province? Be seated, please. Thank you. The member from Durham will come to order. The member from yeah, I, kn I know what it is. I know what it is. I'm giving him time to contemplate. The member from Stormont, Dundasco, and Gary come to order. You guys haven't got the message. I'll have to be even tougher. 
Please, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, the premises of her questions are very uh, false, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, we talk about Heinz, we talk about energy prices in the United States. They blame the closure of Heinz on energy. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, two Heinz manufacturing facilities were closed the same day in the United That's States, correct. Mr. Speaker. So they want to use the United States as a good example, but, Mr. Speaker, they have no credibility in terms of what they're saying. Mr. Speaker, we have created a reliable system of electricity. Mr. Speaker, we've made huge investments in the sector because of their deficit. And Mr. Speaker, yes, it put pressure on prices. But in the meantime, we have created programs that ameliorate the pricing, Mr. Speaker. For industrial consumers, we've created the Industrial Conservation Initiative. We've created the Industrial Electricity Incentive Program. We've created Answer. the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, Mr. Speaker. And with respect to cliffs, Mr. Speaker, we put something on the table that was very, very agreeable and acceptable, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. with respect to energy. Yeah. New question, the member from Nickelback. Yes, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A question for the Premier. Wives launch a human rights challenge against this government because of two decades of gender discrimination. Ontario midwives are paid 52% of what they should be earning. For years, midwives, the family they care for, and the NDP have asked this government to take action on this most basic equity issue. We know that the government can talk a good game about the value of midwife and the good care that they provide, but can she tell us why she has ignored her obligation to pay equity to this female-dominated essential health care provider group? Uh, well, Speaker, uh, what I can do is tell you that we do tremendously value the work of midwives. That is why, Speaker, we've got three times as many women getting care from midwives now than we had just 10 years ago. That's why we've increased funding to midwifery programs fivefold since we were elected, Speaker. That's why we've increased the number of spots in our midwife training, because we believe that women who want the care from a midwife should have access to that care. But, Speaker, our commitment does not end with those investments. We have increased compensation to midwives by 25 per cent over the past 10 years. As speaker, our commitment to midwives is strong and remains strong. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, what the minister just told me is that she is comfortable with men being paid 48 per cent more than women to do the exact same work. As midwives tell us, to devalue midwifery services is to devalue the people for which midwives provide services, women and their family. Today, Ontario midwives are being asked to work from free from July 1st to December 31st. Midwives are angry and frustrated, and after years of being ignored by this government, they had no choice, Mr. Speaker. They had to pursue legal action, so this government follows their own law. So is the minister going to fight in the courts? These women that care Question. for 20,000 women and newborn each year, or is she going to respect her pay equity obligations? Um, speaker, I have uh, firsthand witnessed the extraordinary care provided by midwives. On two occasions, I've been present at the birth of a grandchild in the care of the midwife. Our premier has had two of her three children cared for, delivered by midwives. Speaker. Our commitment and our respect is enormous. I think it's important the member opposite gets her facts straight. Speaker. We provided the first compensation increase to midwives since they were established in 1994. In 2005, midwives received a 20 to 29 per cent salary in increase. From 2006 to 2011, every year, a 2 per cent compensation increase, Speaker. I do not understand, I confess, why the midwives are going this route, but I am very, very proud of our record, and I will defend our record. Thank you. New question. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment. Today, November 27th, is the 2013 Environment 
Ontario Environment Industry Day. Established in 1991, the Ontario Environment Industry Association, otherwise known as ONEA, is the business association representing the interests of the environment industry in Ontario. This not-for-profit not environment business association is governed by a board of directors and has approximately 200 member companies. The Ontario environment industry sector represents over 40% of Canada's environmental industry and generates an estimated $8 billion in annual revenues. This industry is important to the future of Ontario's environmental and economic health. Speaker, through you, would the Minister of the Environment please share with this House more about ONEA Question. and how they fit in Ontario's environmental and economic plans for the future? Thank you, Minister of the Environment. Well, the question is a very timely one, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to acknowledge uh, the 2013 Ontario Environment Industry Day. This is an interesting figure. With more than $8 billion in annual revenues, including more than $1 billion in exports, the Ontario environment industry sector is making an important contribution to Ontario's environmental health, the quality of life of its citizens, and our economic strength. We want to see that continue under the government's plan to invest in people, build strong infrastructure, and support a dynamic and innovative business climate. Exactly. The Ministry of the Environment will continue to build on the long-standing relationship we have with ONEA through events like the Environment Industry Day, our supportive research projects like the Ready to Grow initiative, and its follow-up, Still Ready to Grow. Answer. ONEA has had a positive and constructive relationship with our government and is interested in continuing to work with the province on strategies to support you. and grow Ontario's environment thank industry. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again, uh, Minister, for the update. This established partnership between the Ministry of the Environment and the Ontario Environment Industry Association is a great example on how this government is following through with its economic plan to partner with key sectors of the economy. This plan will encourage technologies which will help protect our land, our air and water. The results will build on Ontario's environmental strengths as well as contributing to our economic and competitive strengths. Speaker, through you, would the Minister of the Environment further elaborate to this House how our relationship with ONEA will help protect our environment and foster the development of environmentally friendly infrastructure. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member has appropriately asked an important question. Strategically as well, he probably stole the next question from the official opposition. Exactly. So I'm <laughs> pleased to answer the question that says, when municipalities need to upgrade water or sewage treatment, who are they going to turn to? When industries need to abate air or water pollution, who are they going to turn to? When producers of goods need to set up a recycling system, who are they going to turn to? Jim Bradley. All these organizations, with all these challenges, are going to turn to a company that is a member of the Ontario Environmental Industry Association. It's important that we have associations such as this in Ontario. And I look forward to continuing to work with Ontario's environmental industry yes, to ensure we have a healthy environment and a clean, prosperous future for our province. And remember applaud, remember to attend the reception today. Question the member from here on Bruce. Hi, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, much to the dismay of Ontario taxpayers and ratepayers alike, your government is facing lawsuits by two companies whose wind projects were cancelled by your government as a result of a 2011 pre-election moratorium on offshore wind development. We have learned Trillium Power Wind Corp has filed a $2.25 billion lawsuit, and Windstream Industry is seeking damages in the amount of almost half a billion dollars. If the government loses these lawsuits, it could cost taxpayers $2.7 billion, on top of the $1.1 billion it costs to cancel the gas plant. And the irony in this is Windstream was motivated to seek damages because of your gas plant fiasco. Yep. Premier, given the pushback against offshore wind in an election year, was the decision to put a moratorium on offshore Question. another Liberal seat saver scheme? And will the Liberal Party be picking up these costs if run. indeed these lawsuits are successful? Premier. 
Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, 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 hear the, uh, I hear the question, but what I don't hear, Mr. Speaker, is any consistency on this front at all. Because my understanding, Mr. Speaker, is that this party's against wind altogether. That this member would have us cancel all the projects, Mr. Speaker. Well, and, and I hear the heckling from the member from Renfrew. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. And the member from Durham is warned. I hear the heckling that they, they don't support they don't support wind power at all. And that's exactly my point, Mr. Speaker. They don't support green power. They would cancel all of the contracts. We, Mr. Speaker, believe that green renewable power is the right way to go. We believe that phasing out all of the coal plants and, and banning that generation in the future is a good thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Answer. They don't believe that, but they would have all those contracts cancelled, Mr. Speaker, and that's not consistent with the member's question. Clearly, Speaker, clearly, Speaker, that answer. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, clearly that answer was practiced, and they were waiting for this because this truly is another example of liberal mismanagement. Back to the premier in 2011, during an election year, the minister of energy contradicted the then original claim of the minister of natural resources and declared there was not enough scientific evidence to proceed with offshore development. So now, in 2013, study after study, even in your own University of Waterloo study, is demonstrating an association between proximity to turbines and negative health impacts. So, where are we going with this? The Liberal government chooses to cite evidence in one example, and yet you ignore evidence on the other hand? Premier, will your government just stop all of this madness and call for an immediate moratorium on all construction of turbines? Take two. Thank you. Take two. Thank you. Thank you. Please. You see it, please. Thank you. The Attorney General will come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, to the accusation that I practiced the answer, I never could have predicted such an, an inconsistent question. So, actually, Mr. Speaker, I could not have practiced the answer to that question. So, let me just say this. The member opposite, on the one hand, is, uh, is berating us because there is a legal case because we have cancelled projects, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not going to comment on, uh, on the specific specifics of that. But on the other hand, she's saying we should cancel all of the projects, Mr. Speaker, thereby potentially incurring more legal situations, Mr. Speaker. So there is no consistency in this party's approach to energy, Mr. Speaker. There is no consistency in this party's approach to the process of citing infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to work to put a better process in place, but we are not going to look, be looking to the inconsistency of the Conservatives in order for fight to for guide, guidance on that, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. The member <coughs> will come to order. Last time. My question is to the Premier. Premier, Common Voice Northwest was here at Queen's Park yesterday raising concerns with the recent announcement your government made about for a partial biomass conversion of the Thunder Bay coal plant. The report says that the biomass supply approved is far too small to supply the energy required by Northwestern Ontario, even in the short run. How come you can come up with $1.1 billion to cancel two gas plants in southern Ontario and you can't deal with the issue of Thunder Bay? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question from the member. Uh, I did have the opportunity for a short while yesterday, Mr. Speaker, to uh, speak to some of the delegation, including Ian Angus, who uh, thanked me for the decision, Mr. Speaker, uh, of doing it. He did raise some questions with respect to supply of the, uh, the biomass. He came up with some very positive suggestions on how that can be met, uh, and uh, we are certainly going to take those into account. Mr. Speaker, our energy plan for northwestern Ontario is very, very solid. It's extensive. It involves two and a half billion dollars of investment that we're projecting. Wow. The energy security of Thunder Bay is absolutely
absolutely secure, Mr. Speaker. They're going to have a plant. We're going to extend the life of that plant, the biogas uh, uh, yes, component, sir. Mr. Speaker, Except. if it's required. They have the electricity when they need it, where they need it, Mr. Speaker. It's extremely reliable. Wow. Minister, uh, quite frankly, that is pretty shocking, what you're saying, because you should know as Minister of Energy that northwestern Ontario is, is very different when it comes to supply and ability to utilize the grid than anywhere else in the province of Ontario. What's happening in Thunder Bay is, is that that used to be a plant that was able to provide electricity to the Northwest, and now what you're going to have is a peaking plant which is going to produce far less power than what the region needs. So I ask you again, why is it that your priority was to spend a billion point one dollars to save a few seats in Mississauga Oakville, but you're not prepared to support the people of Thunder Bay, Thunder Bay in the Northwest? Mr. Mr. Speaker. This absolutely is an NDP question. They're asking, us, they're asking us to make investments that are not required, Mr. Speaker. We're making the necessary requirements. That was the for us we're to cost we're relying on the experience of the independent electricity system operator with respect to reliability. Mr. Speaker, it's the right solution at the right time for Thunder Bay. They will not have to worry about their energy generation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, Speaker. And for the record, this question has only been moderately practiced. Ma question est pour le ministre du Dep I have a question for the Minister of uh, Trade Development, uh, Mr. Herrick Hoskins. The government has officially launched its youth job strategy. This is especially important to families in my own riding of Etobicoke North. The government's announcement came after a series of consultations which brought together local business leaders, employers, not-for-profits, educators, labour and, of course, the youth themselves. These discussions involved, provided a local perspective about the needs of the various stakeholders and participants and directly influenced the design of this important program, the Youth Jobs Strategy of October 16th. Speaker, would the minister please inform this chamber, when can young people in my own riding of Etobicoke North and, of course, beyond in Ontario, when can they begin to start accessing these funds? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for this uh, great question. Uh, these funds, uh, $295 million investment by the government over the next two years, will create 30,000 jobs across the province for young people. And with the youth job strategy fully launched now, all funds are open and are receiving applications. We have a youth skills connection fund, which will see the first deadlines in December, and the funds dispersed in early 2014. We have a strategic community entrepreneurship fund, which will have a series of applications windows, Mr. Speaker, that will see intake and fund dispersion running all the way through to January of 2015. A high school outreach program accepting applications now with applicants receiving notification next month, Mr. Speaker, and summer company designed to help students run a summer business. The application process is open all the way through to next May. So each fund has a distinct application process. It's important that those interested go to our youth and job strategy website, ontario.ca backslash youth jobs. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I commend the Minister on this program, his outreach to youth, and the multifaceted nature of these disbursements. I, of course, Speaker, will do my part in my own sphere of influence to publicize the fact that our youth job strategy is underway, applications are being received, and that youth in my riding will be able to apply now. The young people of Etobicoke North also recently heard about the Youth Employment Fund and the great opportunities that it also offers. Speaker, youth unemployment is a significant concern for parents and families, and this program is welcome, encouraging, and much needed news for them. May I respectfully ask the minister to please advise this house, how can young people access the Youth Employment Fund? Question, thank you. Minister? To the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Your training college university. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very pleased to be able to report to the member and all members of this house that we've had great success with the uh, Youth Employment Fund. After just two months, Mr. Speaker, 3,721 young people have act, uh, active job placements through the Youth Employment Fund. Ultimately, this fund will benefit 25,000 young people overall. This program allows young people the opportunity to gain valuable work experience while earning an income. Youth and employers can apply for this fund by reaching out to our local Employment Ontario service providers. And in the members' riding of Etobicoke North, young people can turn to the Community Micro Skills Development Centre on Vulcan Street, Humber College, 
and the YMCA on 1530 Albion Road. Mr. Speaker, those are some of the areas they can Answer. apply to for this fund. We're proud of the work that's being Good done, stuff. and we encourage that member and all members to encourage young people in their ridings well. to you. access this very significant and successful program. The question the member from Wellington, Holton Hills. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, as you'll recall, almost eight months ago, A.O. Smith, the water heater manufacturer, which has been our economic cornerstone in Fergus for almost 100, over 100 years, announced it would be ending manufacturing there, putting 350 people out of work. These lost jobs are not a myth. They are real, and they are going to the United States. This was a devastating blow to our community, but we carry on, expecting the provincial government to do its part to establish a competitive economic climate and encourage the creation of new jobs. This fall, our caucus was prepared to work with the government to clear the backlog of legislation before the House, but we had one request, that the government bring forward a jobs plan. My question to the Premier is simple. When will the government be tabling its jobs plan? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Mr. Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, I appreciate that the member opposite has uh, raised the issue of A.O. Smith. I know he's been working very hard uh, with his community on this issue, and he knows my own personal attachment as well with the company. My great uncle worked there for 50 years, from the from the, the floor all the way up into the management. And and uh, there's nothing more important to this small community of Fergus to, than to be able to uh, grow their economy and provide jobs for people going forward. So we are working hard, and the uh, member opposite knows that. There are uh, measures in place, and the government has been active with a number of companies. We're hoping that there will be some good news uh, in the foreseeable future. And of course, for the employees that unfortunately lost their jobs, we've uh, set up an action centre that uh, provides them with uh, job search uh, support as well as yes, training opportunities. It's a community that's very important in southwestern Ontario. It's very important to this uh, to this government, and as I mentioned, it's very important to me personally as well. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, as far back as 2005, I was ringing the alarm bells in this House yep. about the competitiveness challenges faced by Ontario's industry yep. and the need to develop an action plan to save manufacturing jobs. Mr. Speaker, they ignored us. Since then, we have lost more than 300,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs, 38,000 since the Premier was sworn in last February. This number includes the 350 people who lost their jobs at A.O. Smith in Fergus. These job losses are more than just statistics. With the Christmas season soon to be upon us, we're talking about thousands of families who worry about their future with good reason, and they see a provincial government without a clue of what to do. If the government can't come up with a jobs plan of their own, will they adopt ours? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, here's where I need to disagree with the member opposite. We have a jobs plan. The problem is that the PCs didn't support it. You didn't support it back in 2008 when we provided support to the auto sector. If it had, if it had gone your way, GM and Chrysler would have left the country. You didn't support us last year when we created the South Western Ontario Development Fund, which has created and retained more than 7,000 jobs in the last year alone. You voted against it. You didn't support us in the youth job strategy, which we just heard a, a moment ago has resulted in more than 3,000 placements already in a $300 investment over the next couple of years. We have a jobs plan. The problem is that you refuse Order. to support it. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, the member from Welland. For years, new Democrats have strongly supported legislation which certain occupational-related diseases are presumed to be job-related for WSIP purposes. Along with the Ontario firefighters who are here today, we agree it's time to add testicular, skin, multiple mel melanoma, breast, lung, and prostate cancer to that list of diseases to be presumed. In fact, the government has told firefighters they agree too. Will the Premier actually change the existing legislation to add these, disease, these diseases, or is she just simply making commitments that she has no plans to change? Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I, I thank all the, mem uh, uh, the member from opposite uh, for asking this important question. And I again welcome all the very hardworking firefighters who are here uh, in the assembly today. All from Ottawa.
Speaker, I, I, speaker I, I, I thank all, all the firefighters for the hard work they do and, and keeping, making sure that our communities remain safe. And that's why, Speaker, I'm very yes, proud sir. to stand here today that it was in 2007 our government was the very yes, first government uh, to bring a presumptive legislation yes, in the province yes, of Ontario yes, recognizing eight different cancer and heart diseases. Thank uh, you. Making sure we thank our firefighters. For thank you. Supplementary. Premier, so what we need is action, not standing ovations. That's right. The reality is that firefighters are exposed to many toxic substances in the course of their duties, and as a result, they face higher risks of certain cancers. This new legislation would build on presumptive legislation from 2007 that deemed a number of other cancers like esophageal and colorectal, non-Hodgkin's disease, lymphomas, and leukemia and heart injury within 24 hours after fighting a fire deemed occupation-related. I ask again, is the Premier prepared to pay more than lip service to the firefighters so that these brave men and women who face dangers day in and day out on their jobs can be treated with respect and dignity? And when will she do it? Question. Minister. Speaker, thank you. I thank, I meant, I thank the member again, and I want to thank the member from uh, Vaughan for bringing forward Bill 81, which actually uh, suggests uh, that we uh, we add uh, six uh, additional cancers uh, to uh, the presumptive list. So I thank the member for Vaughan for his leadership on this very important issue. And, uh, Speaker, I want to assure you and through you all the members of this legislature that we're working very closely uh, with the uh, members of the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association. Uh, the Premier had the opportunity to speak with them uh, and to show our commitment to our firefighters that will continue to work hard here, to make here. sure that all firefighters are here, safe here. at their workplaces, uh, that, they, that they are fully protected uh, to ensure that they can continue their job. And I'm very proud of our a very positive, constructive working relationship with our firefighters yes, that will sir. continue to work with them and making sure that they're safe every single day. On a point of order, before our deferred vote, let's make it quick. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Welcome to the chamber today and to Queen's Park. Uh, Valerie Miles and Steve Carson, realtors from the Renfrew County Real Estate Board, in my riding. Thank you for coming. The, mem the member from the member from Bramley Gore, Malton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to also introduce uh, into the guests or into the Legislative Assembly some guests that were in the Members Gallery. They're no longer, but they're firefighters from my region. James Taylor, Dan Boyer, Kane Demers, Mike Scarangella, Ryan Ocher, Mark Train, and Ryan Coburn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome guests from the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association, Association joining us uh, this morning for question period. Brett Gibson and Steve Mayer from the Waterloo Professional Firefighters Association. Welcome to Queen's Park. Energy. I uh, just want to correct the record to the uh, question from the member from Timmins. I mentioned uh, in my supplementary a biogas plant that should read biomass plant, Mr. Speaker. Very good. Yeah, correct the record. Member from Lampton Kent Middlesex. Much, uh, Speaker. I'd quickly like to introduce a friend of mine and the mayor uh, from Strathroy, Caradoc, Joanne Vander Hayden, who's here today at Queens Park, and other members of Ontario Good Roads Association. Thank, thank you. you, Leeds Grenville. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to correct my record this morning. Uh, in my uh, speech about Bill 133, I, in error, forgot. I promised her that I would mention her and her hard work. She's a senior policy analyst with uh, my leader, Tim Hudak's office. I want to acknowledge the hard work of Larissa Smith. All thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, introduce a very important spiritual leader from the town of Oakville, the Reverend Jim Gill, and his wife, Bonnie, have joined us at Queen's Park today. I, uh, I do want to make a point that this is a little unorthodox because we have a, a rotation for introduction of guests, and uh, I have told you that while that we're doing that, I'll even go past the time in order for us to do that. This is a, an important cyclical thing we need to do. So uh, from now on, I'll be a little less patient on that particular issue. We have a vote. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 55, an act to amend the Collections Agencies Act and Consumer Protection Act 2002 and the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act 2002 and to make consequential, consequential amendments to other acts. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
members take their seats, please. Would all members take their seats, please? On November the 26th, Ms. Charles moved that third reading of Bill 55. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Charles. Ms. Charles. Mr. 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 Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Balkison, Mr. Balkison, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Ms. Domerla, Ms. Domerla, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Ms. Manga, Ms. Manga. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Holiday. Mr. Holiday. Ms. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those polls, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 96 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Chelsea and Hutchard, please read it Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.